Yeah, I think the general drift of the Bible portrays God as powerful. Um, and it's funny sometimes when, you know, like I'll post my the title of my book on social media, someone will retort by quoting some passage, usually from the Old Testament, that talks about, you know, great is the Lord and mighty in power. And uh, as if that's a, some sort of a undermining of my claims in the book, which of course it's not. I do think God is mighty. I just think that we've not been very careful in trying to describe God's power in light of God's love, in light of creaturely freedom, in light of logical contradictions, in light of ontological contradictions, in light of a whole host of factors. And therefore, many Christians have a God, at least the way they talk about God, who is actually too big to make any sense. They describe God in ways that it's, are so outlandishly large that they can't then make sense of what we've already mentioned, like free will. Um, and so that's part of what I'm doing in this book, is giving us, we might say, a right-sized view of God's power. If God has a face, His face must look like yours. Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson, and we are back with a new guest. Well, old guest, but returning guest. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Dr. Thomas J. Ord. And uh, for those of you who have been listening for a while, you probably remember him coming on in support of a couple of his prior books, including God Can't. Kind of stirred some stuff up, which is kind of fun to do every once in a while. But uh, it's it's one of those topics, uh, the topic of like, why does... Why do bad things happen uh, to good people? And, you know, why is there pain and suffering in the world? And, and um, why doesn't God intervene? Uh, it's one of those questions that a lot of folks ask, and especially a lot of folks who have abandoned religion altogether, because, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you reconcile that? You know, uh, one hand, we're talking about an all powerful, all loving God who can do anything. And yet, you know, we, we continue to see things like school shootings and, and, uh, you know, forest fires that take out entire, you know, neighborhoods and uh, all sorts of awful violence, that, you know, wars and, you know, like the one happening in Ukraine. And yet, you know, it doesn't seem as if God uh, intervenes. And so what does that mean and how do we reason with that? And so uh, he's taken a stab at it in a couple of his books prior, and he's got a new one uh, that just came out that is uh, kind of builds on that work called The Death of Omnipotence and Birth of Amipotence. Oh my gosh. And, and he had to write a book using creating a term that is incredibly difficult for me to pronounce. And I think I nailed it one time in this entire interview. Amipotence. There we go. Yes, I got it. I did it. Um, but it's a really interesting, uh, again, it's a really interesting theory that he puts forth. And um, it was a really fun conversation to have uh, you know, in, in regards to, um, you know, someone who's willing to take a stab at that particular, um, you know, conundrum that, that we've been dealing with for thousands of years. So really, really fun conversation. So this one's a one parter, a little bit shorter, but, um, you know, hopefully you guys enjoy it before we get into it though. The usual housekeeping stuff. If you get to our website, uh, it's been active, very, very active recently as has our Patreon, uh, account that you can link to from our website, www.thedeconstructionist.com. That's plural. Uh, if you go there, uh, new blog posts, um, obviously all the w- episodes uh, from all the way back to the beginning, you can stream directly from the website. Uh, and uh, you can link to our web store, our Patreon, if you want to support us there. I put all of the episodes out a week early, uh, unedited, uncut, for any uh, Patreon supporters at $5 or above. Uh, So if you want an early uh, copy, whatever you want to call it, if you want to stream it early, (laughs) uh, you can do so in its full form, uh, the entire um, interview, uh, as opposed to uh, in two parts. So you can get that there. There's a bunch of other packages, uh, and we have international shipping uh, for some of the merch on there now as well. So 
check it out. Uh, otherwise, you know, we've got, uh, like I said, new blog posts going up and some more coming and, uh, we'll, we'll put some, uh, some old school photos up there too. If you want to see some behind the scenes stuff. So all that, uh, you can find there on the website. So, uh, with that, I want to thank uh, Forrest Clay, our friend Clay Kirchenbauer, for providing the music on this week's episode, and our sponsor, HelloFresh. Uh, you just heard the commercial, but uh, as I always say, um, I, I try to back uh, sponsors that are products that I would or have used, and this is one that I've been using for years, actually, and as a single dad, saves me a ton of time. I totally believe in it. Their meals are delicious, and uh, my daughter and I just got our uh, got a, our package today and, um, we'll do our usual tradition where she'll open the box and she'll decide which one she wants for dinner. And then that's the one we'll make. So, uh, but you get free, free meals, 16 free meals and free shipping. Uh, if you use the deconstruct 16, uh, discount code at the website, all the details are in the show notes, check it out. Uh, otherwise let's get to it. Uh, and I can't do the freaking because he's a three-parter. So <laughs> without further ado, I give you Thomas J. Ord. It looks like us. Does God know my name? Is the ache in my soul just gone? All right. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I have a returning guest, uh, Thomas J. Ord. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Oh, my pleasure, John. Yeah, I feel like I've joked before with uh, some of my other returning guests that I need to start offering like uh, like those five timers jackets that they have on SNL. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a very a special but small club. So no, I, I appreciate you coming back on. And um, we were just talking before we started recording uh, your, your new book. Uh, really, is just uh, you always do such a great job of of your next book. Really, kind of building off the prior and, and there's a, a nice thread throughout. So this is really a natural progression of, of God can't and, and your follow up uh, on that. So um, appreciate you coming on to talk about it. Yeah. Appreciate the opportunity. I, I wanted to write a book that I thought, uh, well, we'll get into the discussion, I'm sure, but there's some new things in this book. Uh, and then I say some things I've said in the past, but I say it in a different way. Yeah, yeah, you take a slightly different approach. So I'll, I'll say the, the the book is called "The Death of Omnipotence and Birth of Am Amop Oh gosh, I knew I was going to stumble over that. Go ahead That's and say right. it for me. <laughs> the birth of omnipotence. Yes. So, um, <laughs> like I said, it, it really builds on your on your prior work. So what what kind of inspired you to sort of dive into this this aspect of sort of your uh, you know your the the um, ideas that you've kind of put out there. Yeah. Well, this particular book has four chapters and I think of it kind of like four movements in a concerto or something. Um, and three of the chapters are really pretty novel on a set of ideas. One chapter, the, when I address the problem of evil, it's kind of addressing some of the themes that I have in previous books, but I wanted to come at it from a different angle. So, um, you know, just a quick overview. The first chapter is arguing that omnipotence isn't in the Bible. The second chapter is arguing that philosophically, the word omnipotence has to be qualified so often that it dies a death of a thousand qualifications. Third chapter is addressing the problem of evil. And I make the argument that uh, evil ends or at least should end the idea that God is omnipotent. And then the last chapter, uh, you know, people read my book, God Can't, and some other books, and they kind of got the impression that um, God can't do anything. And they, they thought they had to choose between an omnipotent God or an impotent God. And that last chapter is my constructive alternative uh, with regard to God's power. Yeah, I think I think uh, starting off with the first chapter, I think before we really dig into uh, into the book here, uh, start by defining for folks like what what do we mean uh, generally speaking when we say um, omnipotent? Because that is pretty a common common theme throughout you know at least uh, American Christianity. You know, it's in worship songs. You know, we sing hymns about it. Uh, we talk about it in Bible school. Uh, it, it seems like it's just this kind you know thing that's just always been there, but you know, what do we mean by that? 
Yeah, and that's actually an interesting question in itself because there's oftentimes not a clear definition of omnipotence provided by whatever author is using the word. So at the outset, I say when I'm using the word omnipotent, I'm referring to at least one of what I think are the three most common or dominant meanings of omnipotence that you would find not only uh, amongst people on the street, but also amongst the, the major theologians and philosophers in history. One view of omnipotence is that God literally exerts all the power, so God does absolutely everything that gets done. Sometimes that's called divine determinism. And you find some, for instance, versions of Calvinism who have that view of God's power. Second view of God's power says God can do absolutely anything. Nothing is impossible for God. Uh, now, some of these people will say, even though God can do anything, God voluntarily chooses not to do some things. But they think that God inherently or essentially has the power to do anything imaginable. And the third uh, way to talk about omnipotence is to say that God has the power to control creatures or creation. If by control we mean something like God alone can bring about whatever outcomes or results that God wants. So those three meanings of omnipotence are what I address in this book, and I reject all three of them. Yeah, so so start by you, you talk about the fact that you first kind of dive in the fact that omnipotence. You know, where do we when we when we talk about that word immediately we assume that it's found somewhere in the Bible, and so you talk <laughs> about perhaps some of the issues with that. So talk about like you you have three words that you specifically refer to in references to divine power. So talk about those a little bit. Yeah, most English-speaking people, if they pick up one of the translations of the scriptures, they we'll call them the Christian scriptures, they'll read in the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures or the New Testament, they'll occasionally come across the word Almighty in English. And so what I do is I look, I begin with the Old Testament, and I look at those instances in which that word Almighty shows up in English translations and ask, okay, what is the word in Hebrew being referred to here? And there are two words that are at play. One is the word Shaddai. Uh, many people who, uh, may have heard of the phrase El Shaddai. And the other is Sabaoth. Shaddai, according to the vast majority of biblical scholars, means something like breasts. So to say El Shaddai would be the god of breasts. Or it can some it sound it's very close to mountains as well, the Hebrew word sadu. So breasts or mountains, a, a source of nourishment or a source of protection. And then the second word, sabaoth, means something like hosts or armies or a group or a council. And when it's preceded by one of the words that in English we typically dis, uh, translate as God, like Adonai or um, Elohim or something like that. It means Lord of hosts or Lord of the armies or leader of the council. But around, around about the second and third century BCE, a bunch of uh, Greeks wanted to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And when they got to those two words, they chose the single Greek word pantocrator. Panto meaning all, crater meaning something like holding or sustaining. or, And so um, that word, pantocrater, in the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew scriptures, it shows up 10 times in the Christian New Testament. Nine of those in Revelation, and one, the Apostle Paul uses pantocrater when he's quoting the Septuagint, actually. But the real move comes in about the 6th century, when a guy named Jerome is translating the scriptures into Latin, what's usually called the Latin Vulgate. And he looks at that word pantocrator from the Septuagint in the New Testament, and he translates it as omnipotence or omnipotence. And so in the major creeds like uh, Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, when it says, we believe in the God, the Father Almighty, that word almighty was originally omnipotent. And that's where we get that word. That's really interesting. And and so you you kind of dig in from there to some of some of the uh the issues that we have with 
uh, ascribing omnipotence to God. Um, you know, for example, like if God is truly in control of all things, then why does, you know, bad things happen to, to good people? And I know you kind of talk about that in your prior works, but also it sort of clashes against this idea of free will. Cause on one hand we say God can do all things, but on the other hand, we also say, well, we have free will, you know, we have the, the leeway to make mistakes and to go against God's will, but the two can't really go hand in hand. I mean, it's sort of, no, conflicts. <laughs> so talk about that yes. a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think some people start off with by saying, okay, I think God has the most power imaginable. And, you know, sometimes a philosopher might use the word maximal power or almighty or sovereignty or all power. And, um, and then they at least some people want to say, but it seems like creatures also have some power, including free will, self causation. And so, what some folks want to do is they don't want to give up on the notion that God is controlling and has all the power. And they also think, well, but I can't deny my own experience that I'm free. So, they choose a position in philosophy that's called compatibilism that in some mysterious, unknown way, God is both in control, and we have free will. Um, that view, I think, is uh, less and less common in uh, academic uh, circles and like amongst, let's say, Christian philosophers. Most of them want to affirm what's in philosophy called libertarian free will, but it's still there in some places, and it's even there in some philosophers who don't believe in God, but who think that you know the neurons or the atoms or the quarks in some way control all things and, and free will is really an illusion, but they want to say we have free will. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, so, so uh, carrying on with that, that idea, uh, like there, the Bible does in fact, and you point this out in some of your prior books as well, and God can't, um, the Bible does in fact list some of the things that God can't do it. I mean, it straight up says it in scripture that there are certain things that God inherently cannot do. So talk about that a little. Yeah, and that surprises a lot of people when I bring it up. Um, you know, God can't tell a lie, for instance, according to Titus in Hebrews. God can't be tempted, says James. God can't grow tired, says the psalmist. Uh, God can't abandon us, says uh, Hosea. Uh, my favorite uh, uh, passage or statement that I think kind of is an overarching uh, um, claim is that God cannot deny himself, which is a way of saying there are things that God can't do because to do them, God simply wouldn't be God. And in this book, I list those kinds of things in my discussion about God not being able to go against the divine nature. So things like God can't decide to stop existing. God can't be both omnipresent and missing from Miami. God can't be omniscient and yet not know something. And so these are kinds of things that are uh, uh, limitations on what God can do based upon who God is, not based upon some external force or something like that, but just on the divine nature. Yeah, it's, what's interesting is so, sort of one of the takeaways I had from from the book is that um, you know, God can be mighty without being omnipotent. And that's, it, mm. we seem to kind of feel as if it has to be one or the other, as you said at the top, like to be omnipotent, uh, has to be, you know, you, you're either omnipotent or, or completely, you know, without power. It has to be yeah. one or the other when God can be mighty without having control over everything. And it, it sort of led me to the thought that it seems like omnipotence or the idea or the need for God to be omniscient, uh, seems to have to do more with control versus God's ability uh, to act in the world. Mm. Yeah, I think that's fair, at least in a lot of cases. Yeah, I think the general drift of the Bible portrays God as powerful. Um, and it's funny sometimes when, you know, like I'll post my the title of my book on social media, someone will retort by quoting some passage, usually from the Old Testament, that talks about, you know, great is the Lord and mighty in power. And uh, as if that's a, some sort of a undermining of my claims <laughs> in the book, which, of course, it's not. I do think God is mighty. I just think that we've not been very careful in trying to 
describe God's power in light of God's love, in light of creaturely freedom, in light of logical contradictions, in light of ontological contradictions, in light of a whole host of factors. And therefore, many Christians have a God, at least the way they talk about God, who is actually too big to make any sense. They describe God in ways that it's, are so outlandishly large that they can't then make sense of what we've already mentioned, like free will. Um, and so that's part of what I'm doing in this book is giving us, we might say, a right-sized view of God's power. Yeah. So in, in your second chapter, uh, you really, that's where I feel like you really expand on your work in, in God Can't, stemming from the you know, as you sort of already alluded to this philosophical paradox, you know, I, I think the funny one that you, you point out is, you know, can God create a rock that's so big that not even God can lift it, you know? And um, so I, I, I thought that was really interesting. And, and again, you, as you said, you kind of come at it from a different angle though, and, and kind of re-exploring some of the, um, you know, some of the material that you've, you've covered before. Yeah. And, and, you know, in this chapter, if you're a professional philosopher, you're going to start reading this chapter, and the first two thirds of it, you're going to say to yourself, "Oh yeah, we've we've kind of already thought that." But 99% of the rest of the people who believe in God haven't been thinking about these things. They haven't been considering the possibility that God can't make a round square, or can't make two plus two equal 378, or can't decide to uh, you know the, to stop existing, like I mentioned earlier or that God can't both create free moral agents and guarantee that those moral agents uh, will always choose the good. Um, and so all kinds of issues that the average person really doesn't think a lot about. A lot of uh, uh, Christian philosophers have thought about them, but I sort of start listing them out, and I think I have about 50 examples in the chapter. Near the end, I get to some uh, things that God can't do that I think will surprise even professional Christian philosophers. And one of them is my expansion on the very common view that God is a universal spirit without a localized divine body. And that means if God's a spirit without a body, God actually doesn't have divine hands with which to pick up pebbles or do push-ups. God doesn't actually have divine teeth to chew bubble gum. God doesn't actually have a divine toe to kick a, a soccer ball. And so you and I can do a lot of those things uh, because we're embodied creatures. So if we start thinking carefully about these typical views of God and think about their implications, it should make us rethink how we talk about God's power and that, in turn, can help us deal with the biggest objections to belief in God, which one of them is the problem of evil. Yeah, and I definitely want to get into that because I think that's one of the most important parts of, of the book. Uh, before we do that, though, I think uh, one of the, the pieces that, that you kind of just mentioned was one of my favorite uh, parts of your prior work is just this notion that uh, that God through spirit continues to create uh, but does so in conjuncture with God's own creation, meaning that God works alongside human beings uh, to combat evil and to bring good about in the world. Yeah, that's crucial for my argument because, um, because I don't think God ever single-handedly brings about results. And yet I'm claiming God is mighty and powerful. In fact, the most powerful, then I've got to have some sort of account for how God can be so powerful. And yet, be unable to pick up a pebble like you and I can. And the way that I do that is talking about God's omnipresence. So God is everywhere in the universe. And God's action is, in part, calling and empowering creatures to then respond. And so when creatures respond uh, well to God's nudging, God's urgings, God calling, then we can say that uh, God's power is effective in ways that are dependent upon creature response. And if God's omnipresent, if God's been acting this way everlastingly, then it's not that hard to see how God can be the mightiest of all. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I, uh, as I said, that was one of my favorite parts of your, your prior books as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, and it, part of the implications it, is that you and my lives matter. Like, you know, this conversation for this podcast, it actually makes a difference in God's work in the world. I happen to think that God is uh, calling you and I to have this conversation at this time. And so as we respond properly to God's activity, then we are co-creating with God this particular experience in this podcast. And I think that makes a real difference to not only the creation, but to God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Um, so we definitely got to get into this part, though. You, you talked about, you, you already kind of mentioned this, but the uh, I just marked down in my note was the problem of evil and omnipotence. Uh, so talk about that, because I think that is one of the most crucial chapters or sections of the book. Yeah. The number one reason, at least according to the polls I've seen, that atheists give for why they can't believe there is a God is what philosophers call the problem of evil. And that problem is that if there's a God who's omnipotent and perfectly loving, then why is there genuine evil in the world? And by genuine evil, I mean events that make the world worse than it otherwise might have been. Wouldn't a loving God prevent the evil that's preventable? And uh, most theists, including professional theologians and philosophers, they don't have a really good answer to this question because they continue to cling to that classic view of omnipotence. And what I do in one of the chapters, after showing how there's all kinds of problems for this, for politics and religious experience and all kinds of other issues, I get around to saying, if we take away omnipotence, then we can say that God uh, is working with creation, is powerful, is trying to heal, is uh, trying to squeeze something good out of the bad God didn't want in the first place. We can have a really active God, but this God would be uncontrolling and therefore not morally responsible, not culpable for failing to prevent evil. Yeah, and, and the important thing that I love about that uh, is, is also that uh, y- you keep coming back to the central theme of love. Like God, yeah. God, uh, God ultimately is the source of love, and you know that's the central action in all things. Yeah, that's at the heart of my theology. It's the it's the way I try to live my life. Um, I wouldn't believe in God if I didn't think God was first and foremost loving. I wouldn't try to live a life of love if I thought there was no, uh, you know, God empowering and inspiring me to be loving in loving ways. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if we talked about this last time we chatted, but there was a time in my life when I did not believe in God. I was an atheist. And it was the issues of love that brought me to think it was more plausible than not that there's a God. And so those function in my constructive theological work, those ideas of love function as the center of my thinking. Yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, that's definitely a place where I kind of eventually landed as well is, mm. um, you know, when we talk about this this idea that we are made in God's image, you know, as a kid in my childlike brain, I kept thinking, well, God looks like a human being, you know, and <laughs> yeah. as I got older, I thought I've shifted more towards, you know, if God is the source of, of endless love, you know, then then really what that, that means to me is that each of us are born with that love spark within us. And so when we, when we freely give that love away, you know, in, in the sense that it's no strings attached, that it's just purely for the sake of, of, of extending that love, that that's where we see a glimpse of, of God or the divine, um, here on earth, you know, it's, it's, uh, it kind of bringing us closer to the source in a way. Yeah. When we're done with this, let me send you, I wrote a chapter in a book on Imago Dei, the image of God, in which I make that kind of argument that relational love is the best way to think about the Imago Dei. Yeah, I love that. I would love to read that. Um, 
so you talk about, I thought this was kind of funny because, uh, Adam, my, my, uh, my partner who I started this with years ago and I used to tongue and cheek kind of, uh, lovingly make fun of worship music a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> cause it's always, it's always so positive and we're like, where's the lament music, you know, like the stuff mm. of real life, you know? And yeah. so you, you mentioned the fact in the, in the book that a lot of modern worship music is just chock full of references to power and, and Kings and, and, uh, you know, these, these figures of power, you know, and, and, you know, it, it's, and I, in my mind, I kept running back through like songs that I knew that were popular. It's all has a lot of similar phrasing in it. So, yeah. <laughs> so we really kind of like, we kind of really put that out there into the, into the universe, you know, everybody, you know, when you think of a worship song, most of them, you probably think of, you know, it's, it, it has this positive message, happy ending, and God is all powerful and the King of Kings. 